So yeah, again, uh, welcome to our panel discussion about esports and the future of esports. Um, before I introduce myself, I would give the chance the panelists to do the introduction themselves. They know it much better than I what they're doing. So I think we are starting this way here and then we go person by person with a short introduction. What are you doing in esports? And maybe you can give a very short mission what you have in mind for esports. Okay, hi guys. Hello. Uh, my name is Tech, and I'm the vice chairperson of Hong Kong Student Esports Association. So, um, in the esports sector, I'm kind of training because uh, we do believe that students is the first stage of whole esports industry. So we provide trainings or even um, school seminar or team training to different um, students who are interested in esports industry. Uh, that's what we focus on in this uh, esports sector. Yeah, thank you. Hey, my name is Chris and I'm the co-founder at Community Gaming. We are a local events company. Uh, we started running events in New York City about two years ago, and we recently expanded into Los Angeles and Boston. And these are uh, monthly events for games like League of Legends, Dota, Hearthstone, Overwatch. And uh, these are one-day events that typically happen on a Saturday. And we partner with venues. We don't own our own space, but we partner with venues like WeWork, other co-working spaces, land centers, sports bars. And we act as a capacity solution for them. Uh, they want to bring people in the door and we partner with brands, non-endemic, and uh, game developers to be their local activation partner. So we are the community hub in those three cities, and we're going to continue to expand across the US and hopefully internationally soon. So my name is Mika, and uh, my name is completely spelled wrong on the slides. <laughs> my name is Mika, and uh, I'm CEO of NC Esports. NC is an is a esports team. We have three games that we play competitively. Counter-Strike, we are number four in the world right now. StarCraft II, we have a world champion in our roster. And PUBG, we have a first uh, best team in Europe. Um, so my background is 15 years building games and apps companies and ad tech companies. And, and, and last year, I jumped into the deep end and kind of left the product development stuff and, and fully focus on esports. And I'm not sure if there's a mission other than I just see a tremendous opportunity because the audience is growing. Uh, esports is going to mainstream. Young males uh, are not anymore. I mean, esports, they follow more esports in many countries, many regions than they follow traditional sports. So there's tremendous opportunities for, for the industry. Um, so to introduce again, my name is Adrian. Um, I'm so bad at gaming, by the way. I was a sucker League of Legends before. So my, my, my areas in esports is my company is doing a tokenization as a tokenization company. So we tokenize some of the assets like real estate funds. And esports is one of the areas we're looking at because of the potentials in the future. Uh, we also look at sport teams as well, NBA teams, and uh, working with some of the players in esports uh, in the US now to, to tokenize the ownership and to sell to new London investors. Hello, good morning everyone. My name is Derek. Uh, I'm the founder of Hong Kong Esports and Game Media Asia. So Hong Kong Esports is a professional esports team. We have a League of Legends professional team and an arena father, arena father professional team participate in the top league of LMS and GCS. We also own Game Media Asia. Game Media Asia was founded in 2016. Um, we have a branch in Taipei, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, and Shenzhen. Pretty much we provide gaming content. Um, just this month, we reached 5.2 million monthly active unique users on our Game Media Asia. And what our core vision is, um, is we can provide a connection, a bridge from China who wants to get into Southeast Asia, and anyone from around the world who wants to get into China, um, we can help them connect. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. And may you see we have people from different regions, from different business, so I think we can have a very good um, discussion about how esports may look like in 10 years and what we are thinking esports is uh, going in. Very short to my person, I'm Frank Slivka. I'm the CEO of um, IB Media. 
we have two business fields. One, we run our own projects. One, our new projects is eSports Holidays, where we provide holiday camps for eSports. Um, we have uh, different IP partners like ESL, and we do this program uh, around the world. At the moment, um, it's the first year what we are doing, but we have already partners in five years, and I guess in the end of the year, we have more than uh, 10, 12 partners around the world. The second part is we are a consulting company, so I'm very long in the esports industry for nearly 20 years, and we work with um, various partners from the esports side. One of our partners is an esports online tournament platform, ePulse, and we have them to um, scale the business from a European business into a global business. So um, coming back to our panel, and um, my next question is, um, if we have a status quo right now, and you are from different industries, from different regions, um, how is the perception of esports in your region? So from the public side, and as well from endemics or non-endemic brands. Maybe we go again. Yeah, start for, for me first. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not the big company or like Asia or what. We just focus on uh, Hong Kong region. And I want to share about Hong Kong students and schools, their attitude towards um, eSports or the perception. Um, let's say four to five years ago, I mean nearly 100% of schools won't allow eSports um, appear in the school. It is, they would believe that esports is harmful to their kids, not only the, the teachers or the, the parents. Um, but recently, after like two to three years, we work really hard and we do a lot of promotions and uh, talks like this. They started to realize that this is not um, bad things. In fact, some schools may think that this is a very good education tool to the teenagers. So um, from the perspective of schools, students, or even their parents in Hong Kong, there, there is a climbing number that they are accepting esports industry. And I think that's very happy to see that in just pin, pinpointing Hong Kong. OK. Um, yeah. yeah let, let me ask you a question you talked about. It's a good educational tool. Can you explain that? Yeah. Um, in Hong Kong, there is, um, there is a called STEM, S-T-E-M. <clears throat> so it, it, it stands for, like, um, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> uh, technology, engineering, mathematics, that kind. Um, this is a new lesson to all the students. Um, all the schools want to introduce STEM lessons to the kids, to the parents. Um, they found that esports is a very attractive point to them. Um, by using like, like Minecraft or League of Legends, Dota, they will, the students would like to learn how the statistics works, or the CG computer graphics, or the videos, or even the computer science. They would use these tools um, to educate, to learn um, more from just instead of the books, like the science, the biology, or that kind. So um, that's what I mean that um, STEM education in Hong Kong, they are trying to use um, eSports as a very useful tool. Yeah. OK, thank you. So I'm from New York City, so I guess I'll speak to the the U.S. context. Um, when everyone thinks about esports in the U.S., they think about Los Angeles. That's kind of the hub. That's where you're in close proximity to all the game developers. Um, and the reason we started community gaming in, uh, in New York City is because when we searched, there was really no hub. There was no place for people to come together, an inclusive place for them to come every month and, and share the passion for the games they love. It tends to be a very fragmented uh, community. You have, you know, Brooklyn, Queens, Manhattan, and they're not really linked, and there's no place to come together. So, um, you know, that's kind of the reason we started it. And I think as this localization trend continues with the Overwatch League 
uh, moving to city-based uh, next year. These other top markets, you know, it won't just be Los Angeles forever, right? These other top cities around the U.S., it'll become very valuable to have uh, infrastructure built out there, whether it's at the college uh, and high school level, uh, camps, it can be, it can be anything. Um, so I really hope that, you know, it's not just Los Angeles forever and, and that some of these other cities uh, get a lot more attention. Um. Yeah, from my side, so obviously coming from a small country, five and a half million people, um, so some might question what's our take on esports. I mean, you know, we're already mo moving a lot of the stuff there. Um, and Finland, you know, it's a home from, you know, it's a supercell, it's a Robbio country, so we have extremely, actually long history on developing games and, and, and we're very kind of, you know, gamer friendly. Um, now it comes to the perception of the market. Uh, I, 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 you know, when in my introduction I, I briefly mentioned about this, you know, young males are already, you know, following more esports than any other sports. Uh, this was actually based on a study that was done in, in Finland, uh, maybe January, February this year. This year, so male 18 to 25 are now following more esports in Finland than, let's say, ice hockey and football. You know, Finland is a big country of ice hockey, and we suck on football. So, but but nevertheless, these organizations, these sports, obviously have long long history. Like esports doesn't have that history, but yet the young audience is already following esports more. And what comes to kind of the educational system, there's been uh, for quite some time already uh, a university decrees or university programs, not decrees, but pro programs and also lower education programs of, of, of you know, people specializing on esports, for example, marketing and, and different, you know, areas. Um, and how a, a team can be kind of involved in that is like what we do is... Um, we have, uh, you know, people working on their masters or interns actually, you know, working on their diploma. And there's actually a, a person starting soon who's going to finish his studies. Uh, he's basically researching uh, uh, esports marketing and what can be leveraged from the tra traditional sports marketing. We have a pretty good idea of how it works other way around uh, because we're already bigger than any other sports team in Finland in terms of Twitter and Instagram uh, by having a lot you know, smaller audience at the end of fan base. Um, but this is what, you know, you know, this ecosystem can do. You know, there's so many elements in this industry that, you know, there's there's areas to kind of innovate and there's to kind of really, really push the industry, even as a, as a team like EMS. Uh, just before our panel, we had a, a short um, chat and uh, you mentioned that you're working with telecom companies. If you approached them, they were open to esports or you have to explain it, to educate them, the doors were wide open, how... That's a good question. I think, you know, the telecom operator, one of our main sponsors, Tele, is a big Scandinavian uh, telecom operator. I mean, they own uh, these kind of operations throughout the world, but the, uh, they, they, they bought into eSports two years ago, maybe. We started working with them. And, and, and why they do that is that actually they, they can access a demographic that is very hard to reach through other means. So it's not that they want to do this because of eSports, but they see that eSports is an opportunity for them to actually, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, they want to brand themselves as a, as a, as a carrier who's uh, gamer friendly. You know, uh, we are starting, we are launching soon a ENS mobile subscription for gamers, which is all about data, all about very, very good capabilities for streaming. Doesn't really need to have that much of like voice or, or SMSs. Nobody uses them anymore from the age group. But it needs to be, you know, data, streaming capabilities. And they also sell tons of gaming peripherals, gaming gadgets that you know, it's very kind of organic, you know, in terms of activations we do because our guys, you know, use those things. You, they, you know, our, my team in Berlin, uh, Bob G team is actually using these telecom operator subscriptions from, you know, which are based in Finland. So it's the same, you know, European Union, the roaming regulations enabled them to do that. They didn't have to change anything. So... Telecom is very, very good example of how, how you know brands like that can really kind of dive deep in esports and really integrate their services into it. But then there are other industries that, to be honest, I struggle. For example, I mean, you Frank had in your presentation you mentioned about Air Asia. I'm struggling with our local uh, airline because they don't really get it yet. They don't really yet understand what is the audience, how important it is to actually you know provide them like authentic you know, services and content and integrate them properly. So, you know, it's it's a little bit like the people who saw the light, they, 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 they bought in already two years ago. And then there's a longer way of or route of people that 
you just need to convince, convince, convince. One, once we're seeing esports going to main, mainstream, it, 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 it's going to get easier, but it's still tough with some of the, let's say, the verticals. Um, so, so I think my, my perspective is more from uh, institutional or investment perspective because I'm not fa too familiar with the KOL side of things in, in eSport. But I see over the past few years, even the, the last year, I think I was, last year I was at BlackRock. Actually, we look at eSport as an area for potential investment in the future. And by potential investment, it means that by marketing, sponsoring eSport tournaments, uh, leading to the supply chain or investing in private companies in eSports and ultimately, you know, I, BlackRock own iShares, so ETF, right? Whether there's listed companies in this area. And you may sound that's fancy, but uh, can it, like a lot of different exotic areas have financial products in, in, in that space, right? Uh, so over the past two years, we received quite a bit of requests from investors in China getting access to eSports areas outside of China, right? In Korea, in the U.S., I'm not sure in Hong Kong or not, but it's this stage. Um, and then also investment in a related infrastructure. Related infrastructure as well as financial product, right? Infrastructure by means stadium, right? How much, from a real estate perspective, I think that land is going to grow because there's an eSports stadium there. So I see demand from Chinese fund trying to invest in those in Spain. Um, in terms of Financial product, I see some people trying to come up with innovative ideas in, in private equities, investing in private companies in eSports. I personally, personally uh, I think there's still a lot of question marks to figure out to monetize in, in eSports for myself, but um, that's sort of my 50 cents. Um, I strongly believe the game, uh, the game publishers and the developer will continue to dominate the eSports scene around the whole world, especially Tencent. Um, financial is never a problem for the game publisher. Uh, and today, the players are making a lot more money. Um, I believe in the future, they'll be a lot more stable uh, for League of Legends and um, Tencent-related eSports titles. And, but talent is still very lacked in, um, in Tencent uh, for, for making the middle tier, which is a team owner, to, to break even to support the high salary wages for, for the players and to support the league. And how do they really um, distribute the money through their game for monetization and into esports? Since at the end of the day, esports is still a marketing tool for the game publishers. Um, and we believe in, in, a, in a short future, players and team will be more and more recognizable in the traditional media and in the normal world. But still, continually, um, Tencent will dominate the whole scene. And secondly, uh, for the talent in the region, um, back in 10, 20 years ago, I think esports is never esports or gaming is, is never um, a job. It's more like a passion, and a lot of people are making like we're in the industry without making any money. It's it's just our dream, our passion, and today, like gaming industry is making um, over 112 billion U.S. dollars a year, and more and more people with hard skills, um, with educa high education level, is coming into the industry, but. A lot of them without passion, but since people a lot with the passion, they focus too much on the game and they do not have uh, the working experience other than focusing in gaming, esports. Um, so right now, it, it, there's a balance, and I believe in short future, just knowing how to game or just knowing hard skills is not going to work. And people will be more, you love the industry with more passion and, um, and, and hard skills, and of course, um, esports will be better and better. But in the in in short future as well, less more and more people uh, will be watching esport, participating in esport, but not in the esport industry. So, esport industry will make a lot more money, but there are going to be less players in the game. Especially um, two years ago, uh, there's over one billion U.S. dollars um, uh, money into the industry, like uh, from the VCs. Um, and a lot of, there's a lot of esports startups. But however, uh, the fundamental of esports is still the, on the game developers. And the second tier is the team owner. And, and then down there is the players. Teams, games, and, and the players. So anything else is very hard to survive. And as we can see, um, a lot of the companies from 2016 with very high valuations, they are not here today. But the ones who are very strong, they're continuing to be very strong. 
So I believe that people who have more education on what the industry really is, is about conversion business, how do you convert users, how, how does it increase the gaming monetization, how does it increase the gaming lifetime, and when they have the new IP. Um, and we are always very looking for for Riot new games. Riot has been talking about the two new games um, for, for decades. And, and how are they able to convert League of Legends users into um, their own title through esports? Since King's Glory uh, is an amazing game, 450 million US dollar per, per month, and it's, it's pretty much a clone of League of Legends, although they are from the same company. So, but internally, how does the game publisher use esports users and what they have built to convert into the new games? And this is what we can probably see in a, in a, in a short term. And I think that's a very um, major thing that we can see the future of esports. Okay, so <clears throat> if I can summarize it, then my takeaway is from what you said, it's um, the community itself understands esports. Outside of the community, it's a lot to educate. If it's investors, if it's uh, especially non-endemic brands, um, and the second thing is that publishers use esports as a marketing tool, nothing more. Say that, what is about governments? So, um, Derek, I think Hong Kong is now very massively into esports. How it looks like the support from a governmental side in your country? So, Derek, maybe for, for Hong Kong? Um, um, it's great. Uh, for the past two years, the government has been strongly um, promoting esports, and today we have a lot more exposure, a lot, of ma a lot more recognition. Like five years ago, uh, when you tell someone, oh, you can make money through playing a game, and everyone is super excited, wow. And today, like, if you tell them that you can make money playing a game, I, I think it's nothing new anymore. And today, with the government supporting it, uh, a lot of traditional media is still, um, will be, will be like reporting about esports, talking about esports, we have a lot more exposure. However, um, we'll, we, we need a goal, a government, we need a goal, we need to have an esport industry, or we want to have esport recognition. So esport recognition is is like Korea. They everyone there's a lot of champions. Uh, they always win the world titles for esports. However, esports is losing money in Korea. So to to have this is more like winning an Olympic medal um, for Hong Kong. But that is not an industry. That is um, national pride. Um, so pretty much an, an A-grade player deserves an A-grade salary, but the Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau region is, we have lack of population, and we are not compatible financially as the China or the West. So if we want the A-grade players to stay, we need to provide an A-grade salary, but if we do that, it's kind of reckless as a team owner. So the government can support on the players. I, I'm sure that Hong Kong, there's be like more, more world titles, I mean, world, more world champion, regional champion, uh, as a Hong Kong team or as a Hong Kong player. Secondly, if you look at the, indus uh, the industry, how do you really make money through esports? Since we, we do not own a game title, uh, the game title is not owned by any single region. So to make esports is to really extend the gaming lifetime and increase the, gaming, uh, increase the game lifetime and people who watch esports to spend more money inside the game. So how are we going to leverage it? And no matter how much we we pay for, it's like the English Premier League, we pay for the English Premier League to, to broadcast on today, Now TV or Cable TV, it still belongs to FIFA. So no matter how we promote the tournaments, it still belongs to the game publisher. So in, in a way, uh, excluding the sponsors, since the, the sponsor's idea to sponsor an eSport to tournament is the people who watch the tournament and spend the money away of something else excluding the game since you do not own the game. So how do we really host a tournament without any titles yeah. uh, and, and to, to, to have a very good conversion? Uh, I think nowhere in the world as a regional, people are making money as a, as a government or, or, or the industry. But however, uh, teams who are working with the game titles, a lot of them are doing quite well. Okay. Mika, how is it in Finland? How is the government support esports? Or I think they're still, they're, they're, they're learning their, way, I guess. Uh, uh, Finland has a great um, 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 kind of technology innovation funding in terms of the government. So there's, a, there's an entity called Business Finland nowadays and uh, used to be Technology Fund of Finland. 
they are behind of you know the supercells, the Angry Birds brands, but they also used to support like companies like Nokia. So they've been doing tons of technology uh, uh, funding, right? Mm -hmm. And and in terms of, uh, of, of of giving loans or just you know uh, you know rewarding people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, in esports, they are still trying to figure out what should they do. So if I would have an inno technology innovation that is something that I would target with uh, you know esports like fans. I think there's a nice straightforward route with them. But if I'm having anything other around the esports, whether that would be, you know, I want to you know, build facilities, I want to build you know, like great tournaments, etc. They don't yet have the knowledge, I think, in, in, in the house. So that's why, you know, we're, we're kind of trying to be one of the guys to kind of really push the industry, uh, you know, on that area as well. And Chris, how it looks like in the city of New York, how is the the city um, supporting esports. Uh, any initiatives to um, educate from the them? government? There's there's not really any notable support from the U.S. government. I think they kind of lag behind uh, Asia in the direct support. Where we are seeing a lot of support is from traditional sports billionaires and and the owners there. Uh, they're you know they're pumping money into these franchise slots, pumping money into these these teams at 100 million, 200 million dollar valuations. And you know, quite frankly, it's it's a little bit of a bubble, I think, especially the you know the Overwatch League in particular. It's pretty questionable if that's really going to hit those those KPIs they want to hit. Um, but it is nice that traditional sports is is um, you know seeing esports as the Gen Z millennial you know coveted demographic, and they know they have to be there. They know they have to support it. Um, so yeah, a lot of the sports coming from the. the the developers in the U.S. and traditional sports, not so much the government. Okay, so I guess, and this is my experience um, throughout Asia, but also in Europe, that the community knows exactly what they are doing, but outside of our community, outside of the esports industry, we have, especially if we are talking to non-endemics or governmental departments, government, then we have to educate a lot more that they understand where, uh, what, what esports is and what is needed. And I think what, why what you said in the beginning is uh, education is one of a big part, even if it's qualification for jobs, but even so to especially non-endemic industries or governments to educate what happens in esports so that they really can understand that's not only a trend that will be a huge industry and this was my my next question and maybe you can answer a little bit shorter so that we can have uh, uh, some more topics and come to to a condens uh, at the end of the discussion um, if we are talking about that and we have uh, the discussion about the Olympics my opinion on Olympics esports don't need the Olympics but it is not the question is esports sports or is this entertainment Chris, you talk a little bit about uh, celebrities, um, sports events. If we are looking to sports events, yeah, there's a match in the middle, but there's a lot of entertainment around that. So, what what is your opinion on that? Is esports more sports or entertainment? For me? Yeah, yes, Chris. So, I think it's definitely a bit of both. Um, it it definitely is entertainment. I think someone like Ninja coming along and just kind of blowing the world away, you know, getting these huge uh, non-endemics like Uber to come in and sponsor him. You know, he's not the best Fortnite player. Uh, he's just one of the more entertaining ones, right? And I think now there's people that are even bigger than him, Tifu. Um, so really, I think it pays to have really good personalities alongside really talented players who can make it onto the podium, which is kind of the sports side of things, right? So I think streamers and influencers are incredibly important, and you're seeing that come to light with the the scandal around Tifu and the agencies. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's both, and I think the entertainment side is actually starting to kind of blossom more these days. If two team owners here, so how is your perspective on it, Mick? Uh, it's clear entertainment. Uh, I, I think you know how, like when I join ends and and and, and starting looking like how do we like. How do we approach this in terms of like particularly commercially? Uh, uh, you know, I, 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 there's there's so much more synergies with again mobile games companies than than 
traditional sports team and mobile games that's an form of entertainment as well you need to join the in the audience and then you you know engage with them and you retain them and then eventually you are able to monetize right i mean we treat this as an entertainment uh, and and actually when when you know um, um, we even use a term called competitive gaming rather than we talk about esports often we talk about competitive gaming and and i don't really i mean if people are you know offended about like this is not sports i don't I don't really care. I mean, it's entertainment, it's form of entertainment. How we operate is that we, we, we fill the arenas, right? Or we fill the Twitch stream in terms of like having million eyeballs there in a, in a, in a, in a major finals, and that's, that's an entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think if you, if you um, for me, it's like a sport more than entertainment, to be honest, because now the sport is about a spirit of competing with each other in, in a fair way with rules. Uh, Esports, one of the reasons that they can enter Olympics is not because, just because of the trend, right? It's also because uh, there are rules set around how the game should be played, and it's the development acro across that has been so quick over the past 10 years um, that it could be run in an institutional or national-wide uh, situation. So sport, sport is not just limited to playing basketball, or football, or anything that is have a, it's a spiritual uh, type of thing is on national basis in a fair manner. I would consider sport, but on the entertainment perspective, obviously, uh, companies involved in this space has been traditional entertainment companies. So uh, you you define gaming as entertainment, but esport is just a way when you compete, you, you call it sport. So it's it's same to me. If you um, when a team and you see esports as a sport, so you have a coach, you have managers around your teams. Can you explain it a little bit more how that looks like? So what your management, how it looks like? What, what kind of people are working there? No, sorry. So no, I, I see that for, for any, because when you deal with the competitions, you have your managers that is managing players, whatever is marketing or not. It's like an NBA player going out, doing events, sponsorship. You have your coach, which is, really dealing with your competitions, uh, your in-game talents, your in-game skills, and they have very defined roles during, no matter it's Olympics or tournaments, right? And you, uh, during the entertainment, in the entertainment industry, there's a lot of verticals, right? And this horizontally, there's also a lot of different type of companies. While in Olympics, even though eSport has a, lots of affiliated infrastructures or services, it's purely competing, competing yeah teams with your coach, uh, I think that dynamics has, has helped people across the time to call it a sport. Uh, and we could have definitions of sport next 20 years by competing in different things, right? It could be crypto trading. At the end, it might be a sport. So it just depends on per each person's perspective, I guess. Yeah. Mika, um, as you said, it's for you, it's more entertainment. you have a similar structure for your team? Well, it's a pretty similar stru structure because, on the other hand, like I can again, if I look into commercial perspective of running this as a business, I need to keep investing, having the best coaches, and we just uh, we just brought in a, a, a sports psychology as part of the team, and and uh, obviously, you know, competitive success is the key. Without that, there's not much, right? If you are not, if if we would be top thirty, like thirtieth ranked in the world, you know, we probably turn fifty percent of our turn. You know, now we're number four. So being in top five is, 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 you know, that kind of, you know, brings you so much more kind of incremental success with commercial, you know, contracts, et cetera, et cetera. So basically need to have this combat. So, you know, I, I do agree with that and that, you know, yeah, you need to make sure that you're competitive and, 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 you know, you keep winning. But that then actually brings the audience and brings the fans and brings the followers eventually that then you can commercialize. Because without the commercialization, there's nothing, you know, that's like eventually, you know, we, you know, the industry is not going anywhere if there's no capital. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Derek, from your perspective, um, is this entertainment, this is sports, and say this, how you see esports for you, um, what you are doing, um, how you see esports in 10 years? 10 years is a long, that's a whole separate question. So back to, is it a sport or is it entertainment? I think it has to be both. If you look into esports, um, it's what, 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 men, what the millennials are watching, what the young age are watching. They spend more time on YouTube 
than, um, than TV by far. And we look at the YouTube report on the consumption. Female, they normally look at nails, like how, how to put makeup, lose weight, music, and stuff. But for male, like automate gaming is the top title to people search in, uh, to people search on YouTube. And eSport is a top level of the gaming. Like people with the most skills, most talented, the highest level of the gameplay. So, and back to why the coaches and analysts and all those kind of things, uh, it's because it's entertainment again. So if the market is providing a lot of exposure and reflecting how expensive the players or the team are gonna worth, that's why they can put more support in it, right? If, if, if you're not making any money, everyone's gonna be amateur. You don't even have a coach. But today, eSports is making more and more money. And, and the valuation is super high for, for, for teams. And of course, we can put in a lot more support and everything into it. So it's definitely a sport and an entertainment since there's a lot of skills involved and people need to practice a lot and just not, not just the gaming skills, but your mental skills and your physical skills. And what do I think esports in 10 years? Um, I think, um, again, um, people will be more recognized. Um, players and teams will be more recognized uh, around the world and continue going to be dominated by the game publisher since they own the title. And, and hopefully they can find a way to how, how to let the whole ecosystem uh, to sustain for, for the increase of the, of the player salary and, and, and to maintain a gaming lifetime, to continue to have people to watch it and people to play in it and, and, and people to get their money back on what they invested. Why, um, you are working in more on the grassroots and you saw, uh, talked about education. Is this a trend and how you see how will be uh, esports evolving during the next year? So what we expect in 10 years from esports? 10 years? Um, actually, I do believe that um, there is one word I learned from my lessons. It's called edutainment. It's an education and entertainment. So um, esports, I think that is definitely entertainment. And, um, you know, in this industry in Hong Kong, especially in Hong Kong, we just heard that there is not much expertise or, you know, computer science, tech guys in Hong Kong. So, I mean, we would like to train more or by educations, like the high school educations now in uh, like Hong Kong's um, university or the open, U, uh, open university in Hong Kong. They're trying to um, organize or hold a lessons that is about esports management, or even streaming lessons. This are very technical lessons to the teenagers. Um, after like three to four years when they graduate, we will see there is a lot of experienced workers or technicians yeah. to service to help for our events. And you know, in Hong Kong now, the Cyberport there is a very good venue, right? So. Um, the government provided a very good place, and then the schools provide very good um, educations, and that's the, our future. That must must be better. Okay. Chris, in ten years, esports looks like today or completely different. So a lot can happen in ten years. I think artificial intelligence and automation will wipe out a lot of jobs, retail, trucking, and so forth, and I think a lot more people in turn will spend time playing video games. So, you know, I think you'll have the esports athletes making as much as traditional sports athletes, but then I think you'll have everyone else also able to earn supplemental income spending their entire day playing games if they want to. Um, as you know, I'm a huge blockchain technology proponent, so I think as that evolves, you'll have these in game economies get as large as small countries, and you'll be able to own your assets, you'll be able to sell your skins to make money, and that could be what you spend your time doing if you want to. So I think gaming is already the largest entertainment medium by far, and if we're there, if we're already there today, it's only going to get so much bigger in 10 years, and you're going to be able to, uh, to play games all day and hopefully make money and have a great time. And Mika, in 10 years, will watch people uh, or more people watching your team playing than my favorite NBA team, Houston Rockets. Absolutely, yes. Um, 
In 10 years, I mean, one before going that, uh, um, I can almost guarantee that Counter Strike will still have one of the most engaged fan base and a big one. It's been like that 20 years, so why would it change in next 10? So Counter Strike is, is my bet as a game. Um, uh, but in terms of like 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 10 years, I think you know esports is by far the biggest sport, if you will. I mean, there's been going to be more fans, more followers than for any traditional sports. Um, and whether that's an entertainment or sport, I, I don't really care. Um, but then, what else in 10 years? I think, you know, I'm kind of a little bit what, 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 what you said about, you know, there's going to be more people able to make a living by playing games. I, I, I think even on a high level or, or top level, um, there might, there should be actually additional revenue stream for the players themselves, right? So from a team's perspective, the salaries are, are, the, are the challenge, right, sometimes. Uh, then somebody might question that, well, you know, NBA stars are making much more money, right? You know, yeah, that's true. But, you know, where we are heading is, is it sustainable or not? So I'm, I'm, I'm keen to see ideas in areas where, you know, we could build additional revenue stream for the players themselves. Like they do stream already a lot, so they can make additional income from there. But how can teams help? How can industry help? Can we help them with sponsors? Can we help with, you know, whatever the means are? And I think there's going to be massively disrupted methods of revenue streams uh, in 10 years. And Adrian, um, well, I, I think I will, I'll be interested to see whether eSport is a bubble or not in the next 10 years. Why I say that is because now the business model of eSport is not justified yet for a lot of monetization, but when you look back at NBA teams, it's true that most of them is losing a profit. So they don't have a profit, and most of the valuation on the NBA teams is actually brand value, right? How LA Lakers, how New York Knicks have billions of dollars in the brand, and how could, and can eSports teams have the same kind of level or same kind of mentalities? Most of the value attached to the brand, and players got insane amount of salary, same as NBA players, right? It could be possible. Uh, from my perspective, is the second point is uh, I think no matter what, whether it will go away or not, the data is so useful in the esports industry because now our teenagers are 10 years old, is, is looking at a lot of YouTube videos, they play a, interact a lot with games, and they're the future in in our generations. And how to interact with other industries to sell data, um, and that's why Facebook is so successful, right? And I think esports generates so much of this data uh, for the industries. If I can just add on to the, the data piece, I think you're spot on. And you know, right now, it's not very clear what the ROI is for a non-endemic to yeah. you know, increase double their marketing budget. Yeah. So I think this data piece is going to become increasingly important. And you know, one area that I'm paying attention to is this idea of a fan identity and a portable fan identity. So the example would be, you, know, you love 100 Thieves. You're tipping someone on Twitch. You're buying their merchandise on the site. You're showing up at their local events. Right now, all those data points are, are not connected. We don't know that about that super fan. So if there's a universal gaming ID that can hook into games, hook into social platforms, that'll make the data much more valuable for the teams, for the sponsors, and hopefully the players will be able to own that data and, and be incentivized to share it. Also jumping on the data, I mean, there, I mean we are already some of the contracts we have with sponsors are performance-based. Performance-based can be something starting from competitive success. You need to be within top three in the market, you get bones. On the other extreme, there might be performance-based bonuses based on uh, uh, activations. Like, you know, uh, we work with a the, with the rather large food delivery app, a competitor of Uber Eats, a company called Walt from Finland, they raised like whatever, 130 million. So we have a clear targets every month to drive them X amount of new registration, register, registered users. And eventually, we are not there yet, but we will look into how much money they will bring to their, you know, how many, how many you know, orders they place through the app, etc. So basically, that's a way of performance marketing already there, right? So there, without data, I mean, we can do that. I love to have this discussion going on. Unfortunately, we are running a little bit out of time, but... Um, I think it was really, really good insight view from different perspectives of uh, the industry. And a little bit as a conclusion of it, I think we are just in the beginning. We may know a direction. It could vary. Maybe it's sports, it's entertainment. Um, we are online, yes, but there's the mobile esports is coming. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities 
into it, and uh, I think we will see over the next years in which direction esports will go. Thank you for uh, being here, having these, uh, sharing your opinion and experiences with us. Thank you, and um, yeah, we are done for today. Thank you.